This is Brother Peter Diamond, VaticanCatholic.com. Anti-Pope Francis recently gave a shocking interview to the editor of a so-called Jesuit journal. He was interviewed by Antonio Spadero. I want to talk about the major heresies in the interview, as well as other statements Francis makes that are wicked. There are three major heresies in the interview. Let's consider those first. The three major heresies in his interview are, one, the idea that the understanding of church teaching can be different from what it was previously. Two, his position that the schismatic orthodox should not be and do not need to be converted to the Catholic faith. And three, his position that God does not reject or condemn homosexuals. There are numerous other statements that are extremely interesting in the interview. I will cover those after we consider the major heresies. The first of the major heresies that I want to discuss comes on page 13, where Francis says, quote, The view of the church's teaching as a monolith to defend without nuance or different understandings is wrong. End quote. In the context of discussing the deposit of faith and how the church's teaching is transmitted from one era to another, he plainly states that it's wrong to view the church's teaching as a monolith, that is, as something with an immovable or inflexible character that is to be defended without different understandings. He therefore openly teaches that it's wrong to believe that the church's teaching, that is dogma, cannot have an understanding that is different from what it had before, that is blatant heresy. The First Vatican Council declared, quote, Hence also that understanding of the Church's sacred dogmas must be perpetually retained, which Holy Mother Church has once declared, and there must never be a recession from that meaning under the specious name of a deeper understanding. It also taught that there must be, quote, the same doctrine, the same sense, and the same understanding, end quote. The idea that the understanding of Church teaching or dogma can be different from what it was previously is heresy, and it's heresy on a basic, rudimentary matter of faith. It absolutely proves that Francis is not remotely a Catholic. In fact, consistent with his heretical view that the understanding of church teaching can change with time, he also says in this context, quote, Here, human self-understanding changes with time, and so also human consciousness deepens, end quote. It is condemned heresy to believe that the understanding of church teaching changes with time. As the First Vatican Council declared, quote, If anyone says that it is possible that at some time given the advancement of knowledge, a sense may be assigned to the dogmas propounded by the church which is different from that which the church has understood and understands, let him be anathema, end quote. As Pope Gregory XVI taught in Merari Vos, 1832, quote, Nothing of the things appointed ought to be diminished, nothing changed, nothing added but they must be preserved both as regards expression and meaning, end quote. The next major heresy I want to discuss comes on page 9 of the interview. This is a major heresy that has been largely, if not completely, overlooked by others who have commented on his interview. Francis is asked about ecumenism and the schismatic orthodox who don't accept papal infallibility and the papal primacy of jurisdiction. He says, quote, Maybe it is time to change the methods of the synod of bishops, because it seems to me that the current method is not dynamic. This will also have ecumenical value, especially with our Orthodox brethren. From them we can learn more about the meaning of Episcopal collegiality and the tradition of synodality. He goes on to say that we should, quote, recognize what the Spirit has sown in the other as a gift for us, end quote. Before I continue, note that he's saying that the Holy Spirit sows things in schismatics who reject Catholic dogma. He's saying that we should learn from them how to work on the local level, how to use synods, etc., he goes on to say, I want to continue the discussion that was begun in 2007 by the Joint Catholic Orthodox Commission on how to exercise the Petrine primacy which led to the signing of the Ravenna document, end quote. In 2007, a commission under Benedict XVI officially approved the Ravenna document. The Ravenna document was a joint statement by the Vatican II sect and the Schismatic Orthodox. This statement officially approves the, quote, Orthodox view of the Church, how they work locally. It clearly teaches that they're in the Church since they have the Eucharist, that's a heresy that's also taught in Vatican II. It praises autocephalous churches, that is, schismatic independent churches which reject the papacy. It says that they are an expression of the spirit of the church, and it denies the necessity for the schismatics to embrace Catholic teaching on the papacy in various ways. It's complete heresy and schism. We have an article on that point. Francis says that's the way to go. But that's not even the worst thing he says about the schismatic orthodox in this passage or the most theologically significant thing. The most important thing he says comes next. He is then asked how he envisions the future unity of the church in light of these comments. 
He answers, quote, We must walk united with our differences. There is no other way to become one. This is the way of Jesus, end quote. That's an open, blatant statement that the schismatic Orthodox do not need to be and should not be converted to the Catholic faith. He says that there is no other way to achieve unity, no other way to become one, than for them to remain Orthodox, to walk united with our differences, that is, with their rejection of the papacy. That is total heresy. It's a denial of many Catholic dogmas, the necessity of the Catholic faith for salvation, the necessity of the schismatics to convert, and it's exactly the opposite of what Pope Pius XI taught in Mortali Manimos. He said, quote, For the union of Christians can only be promoted by promoting the return to the one true Church of Christ of those who are separated from it, end quote. Notice that Francis not only blatantly denies that teaching, proving that he's a heretic, but Pius XI says that the only way to promote Christian unity is by telling them to convert, whereas Francis says that the only way to promote unity is to walk united in differences. So he's not only denying the Catholic teaching, he's saying that his view, his heretical view, is the way that must be followed. It's just total heresy and blasphemy. This heresy on the Orthodox, which was also taught by the previous Vatican to antipopes in various ways, carries great theological significance because it denies dogmatic truths at the heart of Vatican Council I. Vatican I made it quite clear in various statements that no one can remain in the Church of Christ without accepting Catholic teaching on papal infallibility and the papal primacy of jurisdiction. Francis teaches the opposite. He rejects, spits upon, and trashes Vatican I. If you adhere to the teaching of Vatican I, you must reject Francis. His denial of Vatican I is a prime reason, among others, that he's not the Pope. The next major heresy I want to cover comes on page 7 of the interview. He's talking about homosexuals, and he says, quote, In Buenos Aires, I used to receive letters from homosexual persons who are socially wounded because they tell me that they feel like the Church has always condemned them, but the Church does not want to do this. During the return flight from Rio de Janeiro, I said that if a homosexual person is of good will and is in search of God, I am no one to judge. He goes on to say, it is not possible to interfere spiritually in the life of a person. He then requotes something he said previously about homosexuals, quote, Tell me, when God looks at a gay person, does he endorse the existence of this person with love or reject and condemn this person, End quote. This is wicked heresy. First, he says that he's no one to judge. That's interesting because the First Vatican Council declared that a pope, a true pope, is the supreme judge of the faithful. Francis doesn't judge or condemn anyone because he's not a Catholic and he's not the pope. Second, he's discussing homosexuals. He says that he's no one to judge, and he teaches that God doesn't condemn or reject them. That indicates quite clearly that homosexuals could be justified despite their wickedness and abominable behavior. And we know Francis is including active homosexuals in his comments because he makes no distinction between people who merely consider themselves to have a homosexual orientation and those who engage in homosexual behavior. Indeed, we know he's talking about those who engage in homosexual acts, because Francis refers to homosexuals who have complained to him that they feel excluded. That obviously includes active homosexuals. In fact, in this very context, Francis speaks of confession. The Vatican II sect would only consider homosexual acts, not the homosexual orientation, matters for confession. Francis then speaks in the very same context of gay, quote, marriage. That obviously refers to and includes practicing homosexuals. Francis also says in this very context that we must consider their, quote, situation and look upon things with, quote, mercy. Since the Vatican II sect does not condemn the homosexual orientation, Francis's comments about, quote, mercy, which come in the context of his reference to confession, only have meaning if he's referring to practicing homosexuals. Francis also applies his comments to both, quote, homosexual persons and to, quote, homosexuality. Read carefully in context, there is no doubt that Francis is teaching that he does not judge, condemn, or reject homosexuals or homosexuality, includes practicing homosexuals. That is totally evil, and it is heresy. Based upon sacred scripture, the Church has always taught that those who practice homosexuality are condemned, judged, and rejected. 1 Corinthians 6.9 explicitly teaches that those who practice homosexuality are rejected from the kingdom of God. That means they are rejected and condemned, the opposite of what Francis teaches. Francis's position is heretical. It constitutes a new false gospel. The church calls homosexuals out of their wickedness and out of their perversion. It calls them to convert. But as they are, they are in a state of condemnation. 
By the way, Scripture is also quite clear that the homosexual orientation is unnatural and results from mortal sin, idolatry, and apostasy. See Romans chapter 1. People can also be delivered from it by the grace of God. Francis's evil and heretical comments about homosexuality come at a time when the acceptance of homosexuality is sweeping the world. It's dominating. It's moving so quickly that people who adhere to the biblical position on homosexuality cannot even run a business in some places. Francis's wicked statement is exactly what the world did not need to hear. It's exactly the message the devil wanted the world to hear to keep it moving without hindrance on its path of perversion. Those are the three major heresies in his interview. Let's consider some of the other statements he makes. On page 8, Francis continues his discussion of homosexuality. He also gets into contraception and abortion. This is a passage that the media gave quite a bit of attention to. He says, quote, We cannot insist only on issues related to abortion, gay marriage, and the use of contraceptive methods. This is not possible. He goes on to say, The teaching of the church for that matter is clear, and I am a son of the church, but it is not necessary to talk about these issues all the time. End quote. Since the Vatican II sect does nothing to stop abortion, gay, quote, marriage, and contraception, as proven by the fact that people who support those evils go to, quote, communion freely, not only at Francis's false services, but all over the Vatican II sect, Francis's statement that we should not talk about these issues all the time clearly means in context that he doesn't want these issues stressed or emphasized that he doesn't want people to consider opposition to these evils, prerequisites, or requirements to consider someone a Catholic. In fact, in this context, he goes on to say, quote, The dogmatic and moral teachings of the Church are not all equivalent. Proclamation in a missionary style focuses on the essentials, on the necessary things. We have to find a new balance, end quote. When he says that we must focus on the essentials, the necessary things, and he's speaking in the context of dogmatic and moral truths, such as the church is teaching against the aforementioned evils. He is actually teaching the very false doctrine condemned by Pope Pius XI in Mortalium Animos. Pius XI said, quote, In connection with things which must be believed, it is no wise licit to use that distinction which some have seen fit to introduce between those articles of faith which are fundamental and those which are not fundamental, as they say as if the former are to be accepted by all, while the latter may be left to the free assent of the faithful. For the supernatural virtue of faith has a formal cause, namely the authority of God revealing, and this is patient of no such distinction. For this reason, it is that all who are truly Christ believe, for example, the conception of the mother of God without stain of original sin, with the same faith as they believe the mystery of the august trinity, and the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ, just as they do the infallible teaching authority of the Roman pontiff." End quote. Pius XI is condemning the idea that when you consider things that have been infallibly taught by the church, some can be considered fundamental and others can be considered non-fundamental. Or as Francis says, some can be considered essential and others can be considered non-essential. From the standpoint of one's obligation to accept those teachings when they are proposed to you, no, you must accept all of them. Francis is clearly making the very distinction Pius XI condemns. He's saying that it's not really necessary to oppose abortion, gay, quote, marriage, and contraception, as his previous statements about how he doesn't judge or condemn the homosexuals prove. What's essential to him is feeding the poor and accepting all sinners. It doesn't really matter if you oppose gay, quote, marriage, contraception, and abortion. And since the Vatican II sect doesn't condemn these evils in reality, his attempt to de-emphasize these issues clearly indicates in context, don't insist upon them. It is purely evil, and it's further proof that he's a complete heretic and apostate. The very distinction he draws is a heretical one condemned by the church. The fact that this is the meaning he is conveying is precisely why the notorious pro-abortion group, NARAL, thanked anti-Pope Francis for his comments. They recognized that Francis's statements mean that people do not have to insist upon opposition to abortion, contraception, and gay, quote, marriage. Now, on page 3, Francis discusses his motto, he says that his motto is that of John XXIII, quote, See everything, turn a blind eye to much, correct a little. John XXIII saw all things, the maximum dimension, but he chose to correct a few, the minimum dimension, end quote. So Francis's motto is that he turns a blind eye to much. And when you consider that the matters he's turning a blind eye to involve heresy, sin, the violation of God's law, it shows you what a wicked apostate he is. On page 6, he discusses sanctity, and he says, I see the sanctity of God's people. There is a holy middle class. I see the holiness and the patience of the people of God, a woman who is raising children, 
a man who works to bring home the bread, the sick, the elderly priests, the sisters, my dad, my mom, my grandmother Rosa, she's a saint, end quote. The point is that he thinks everyone's holy, he thinks everyone's a saint. Sin means nothing to this apostate. Anything goes, everyone's essentially going to heaven, and everything's fine. As long as you feed the poor and accept sinners. On page 9, Francis says, quote, We have to work harder to develop a profound theology of the woman. End quote. What does that mean? It's just more meaningless nonsense that tickles the ears of liberal apostates. On the same page, he also discusses Vatican II, that wicked false council which taught numerous heresies. He says Vatican II is absolutely irreversible. He also says its fruits are enormous. Just recall the liturgy, end quote. Francis thinks that the liturgical fruits of Vatican II are tremendous. Anyone who has any conservatism knows that they were evil and horrible and disastrous. On page 10, Francis praises uncertainty and condemns doctrinal security. In this context, Francis speaks of how it's necessary to have uncertainty or doubt about your encounter with God and your beliefs about God. He says that if you're certain of your position, that's a sign that you're not of God. He even criticizes the view which declares with certitude that, quote, God is here, even though that's exactly what the Catholic Church teaches about God's definite Eucharistic presence in true masses and tabernacles. He also says, quote, those who today always look for disciplinarian solutions, those who long for an exaggerated doctrinal security, those who stubbornly try to recover a past that no longer exists, end quote. These are the people he's denouncing, the people who have doctrinal security. Well, the Catholic Church gives us doctrinal security and certainty. That's what it provides for us. Yet he's criticizing doctrinal security. But he goes on to say, quote, I have a dogmatic certainty. So he does have one. God is in every person's life. God is in everyone's life. Even if the life of a person has been a disaster, even if it is destroyed by vices, drugs, or anything else, God is in this person's life, end quote. So, you should doubt things and forget about dogmatic security and certainty, except in one area, that no matter how sinful you are, no matter how much you reject God, God is still with you. This is just wicked faithlessness. It's also interesting that the article begins by noting that Francis has, quote, austere and simple living quarters. Francis also claims to spend an hour a day in front of the, quote, blessed sacrament and to pray constantly. He's obviously not spending time in front of the Blessed Sacrament because it's not present in the Novus Ordo, quote, Mass. But this is an example of how externals can be deceiving. Acts of apparent piety can be deceiving. Francis is totally evil, as his complete rejection of Christ and the Catholic faith shows. When a person rejects the faith of God, it does not matter what else he or she does. Faith is essential. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, as Hebrews 11.6 says. That's why we see throughout the scriptures that faith is so important to God. Those who deny the faith sever the initial connection to him and are worthless in his sight. That's why if people are rejecting the faith, you cannot judge them by what other activities they may be involved with. You must judge them based on their conformity to the rule of faith. On page 2, Francis also says, quote, I cannot live without people. I need to live my life with others, end quote. I find that interesting because it shows that he cannot tolerate solitude. He cannot stand to be alone with God. He must always be around other people. That's because he's wicked. Evil people hate solitude and have never found God in solitude. Francis also makes numerous statements which prove that he's a total modernist. What he says is essentially exactly what Pius X condemned in his encyclical against the modernists. For example, on page 5, Francis speaks of how, quote, there is no full identity without belonging to a people. No one is saved alone as an isolated individual, but God attracts us looking at the complex web of relationships that take place in the human community, end quote. He's speaking of the collective, the community. In number 23 of Pascendi, the encyclical against the modernists, Pius X said, quote, What then is the church, according to the modernists? It is the product of the collective conscience, end quote. That's what Francis is essentially saying. He also speaks of experience. On page 6, he refers to, quote, It is the experience of Holy Mother, the hierarchical church. He makes this statement in the context of speaking about how the faithful, considered as a whole, possess infallibility, which is based on their collective experience. Modernists frequently speak of experience. Pius X pointed out that they apply experience to tradition and destroy it. 
They don't view tradition as something handed down and faithfully guarded, but as something to be viewed in the light of people's experiences. That's the language that Francis uses because he's a modernist. He's not a Catholic. So those are some of the other quotes that are interesting, which further prove that Francis is a faithless, wicked apostate. But the most important parts of the interview are the heresies I mentioned. The three major heresies are, one, Francis's view that the understanding of church teaching can be different from what it was previously. Two, his teaching that the schismatic orthodox should not be and don't need to be converted to the Catholic faith. And three, his teaching that the homosexuals are not condemned or rejected by God. Those are heresies. Do not allow liars to tell you that Francis's interview has been misrepresented by the media. We've considered the quotes. His statements have not been misrepresented. There are other liars in the false traditionalist movement who have major problems with Francis's interview, but they claim that there's nothing openly heretical in the interview. That is nonsense. They don't know what they're talking about. The first two heresies we covered, even if you exclude the statements on homosexuals, are bold denials of Catholic teaching. Major open heresies. Francis's homo heresy interview is further proof that he's a heretical non-Catholic antipope and that the organization he leads, the Vatican II sect, is not the Catholic Church, but the end times counter church. See our video, What Francis Really Believes, and our website, vaticancatholic.com, for more information about Francis's apostasy and the true Catholic faith.